So first up is Tom Strange, who was the last AMIS member to host a live meeting prior to this at uh, the Siegel, now the Siegel Music Museum in Greenville, South Carolina. So Tom was hoping to be here uh, live, but that did not come to pass, so he pre-recorded his presentation, which we will look at now, and I think then we'll, I believe we'll have him online for some Q&A at the end, so we can go ahead and run his presentation whenever it's ready. The Early Piano in America, 1770 to 1810. Good afternoon, welcome, I'm Tom Strange. The asterisk by 1770 that you see in the title indicates a small pivot from the published abstract for this paper today, as we will have John Watson also presenting and who will cover the earliest piano in America in great detail. While the story of the piano in America is not unknown to most of you, some new details have emerged through activities at the Sigel Music Museum in Greenville, South Carolina, that have prompted me to appear before you today and share with you now. Sigel has recently acquired several new instruments, along with the Sigel collection itself, of course, that help fill in some gaps in our understanding and perhaps pose some new questions as well. Further work with the digitized databases also produced useful guidance as to how an early piano making tradition in America was contemporary with London and European uh, piano building traditions. We've also begun to spot signs of the participation of wives in their husbands' piano building shops, along with some surprising approaches to piano making not seen anywhere but America. In their paper, Piano Wars, The Legal Machinations of London Pianoforte Makers, 1795 to 1806, George Bozarth and Margaret Devenham documented the intense legal suits surrounding the partners of Longman and Broderip, Clementi and Company, Broadwood and Son, and others in and around London. On a smaller scale, America would see similar legal wranglings between piano makers in New York and contemporary with those in London. The earliest appearance of a piano for sale in America was by David Proppert in 1770, who was selling an imported piano along with a harpsichord in New York City. This is only four years after Zuppi began selling his square pianos in London and before many makers like Beck Goner and Bayer would have been in full business. Proppert was selling a piano in Boston a few months later, and it's possible no one in New York City was quite ready for this new instrument. The first commercial builder of the piano, meaning someone making a piano for general sale, seems to have been John Shibley in New York City who was primarily an organ builder and who first appears in papers in 1772. Very little is known about Shevley and he seems to have felt New York City would be more attractive for business than Philadelphia, where he had come from. He located his New York City business with a cabinet maker, Samuel Prince. When we hear from Shevley next, in October 1774, he has a fine woodcut of an organ builder's shop, possibly that of Shevley himself. He now claims to make organs, harpsichords, spinets, and forte pianos on reasonable terms. He advertises chamber organ, a hammer spinet, and a common spinet presumably all made in his shop. It is interesting that he lists forte pianos for sale as separate from other instruments, but speaks of a spinet with hammers rather than a forte piano. Traditional historians have taken the term spinet with hammers to mean a square piano along the lines of Zumpy. This may well be true. It may also not be quite the case though. And the differentiation in Shevley's terms may be a clue. 
In late 2021, an instrument was acquired by Sigel that is, in fact, a spinet with hammers. It is clear from all elements of the design approach that we have studied so far that this instrument was always made to be a piano-like instrument with hammers and never with jacks and quills. The service woods are all American woods, and the dimensions of keys and other elements of the approach are consistent with it being from an early time. We do not contend yet that this is an instrument by Shebley, and I think a later builder may well take the attribution after more work is done. But it is decidedly a spinet with hammers, and we should be careful before we focus on the square piano shape alone to fit what Shebley might have intended. It is important to note that the chamber organ compass from C to F3 for four and a half octaves does not always denote an early keyboard. In rural America, this compass can be found in string keyboard instruments made as late as the 1820s. Four months after Shebley's ad appears, we find the now famous notice by John Berendt 1737 to 1780 for, quote, an extraordinary fine instrument by the name of pianoforte, end quote. For the record, a careful study of the tax, marriage, will, and advertising notices by Berendt give an astonishing number of spelling variations of his last name, but all referring to the same man. He may have been illiterate, or at least searching for a final spelling of his name that worked but it is rarely spelled the same way twice over a dozen appearances. This will be important in a moment. He claimed to have come from Lisbon in his notice of September 1770, and we now think this is very possible, but was likely to have been in London before that. A careful reading of what Berendt says in this ad advertisement is useful for his description, quote, of mahogany, in the matter of harpsichord in several and several changes, end quote, fits an instrument that looks like a harpsichord and specifically like the early grand pianos of America's backers in London. Despite this, history books on the subject of the early piano in America almost invariably state that this piano was a square, again like Zumpy. This is borne out by an instrument made in 1975 and commissioned by the Connecticut Piano Technicians Guild as a tribute to the piano of 1775. It is made along the lines of one inscribed by John Sellers, now at the Smithsonian, who was not thought to have been the original maker. Another Sellers piano has since surfaced that may provide a partial answer to the concerns voiced over the Sellers name board on that Smithsonian instrument. In the spring of 2021, a piano was offered to the Sigel Music Museum that is very likely to be the 1775 grand piano advertised in Philadelphia. Bearing the stamp, John Berendt, London, on the rest plank veneer, it fits the description by Berendt in his advertisement quite well. His use of London here was likely to have meant from London rather than a real place of origin. It makes use of American wood, such as tulip poplar for the key levers and bottom boards, and a plain mahogany veneer with no stringing, cross banding, or other design. The name board inscription, if there ever was one, is now invisible to all light sources tried so far and appears blank. A solid provenance to the early 19th century Southern Pennsylvania area in the same family suggests it originated from close by. It is built very closely to the one extant example of pianos by America's backers in London, even using the English grand action as backers had invented and would have been contemporary with that maker. However, it deviates from backers in a number of small and not so small ways, such that a direct copy is not suggested. Brent solved problems he encountered in ways he might have changed had there been a backer's piano in Philadelphia to copy. Although it was heavily restored by Philip Belt 
and the piano's owners in the 1970s, the original bits that were taken off were largely retained and remained with the piano. A full discussion and treatment of this piano will appear in an upcoming issue of the AMIS Journal. The will and the state uh, for the inventory of Barbara Brent, widow of John in 1797, gives among her effects 20 dozen of instrument makers wire with a value of five pounds. It is unlikely she would have retained this and nothing else from John. The tools all went to a son who died in 1790. It's far more likely that she was vending wire to other instrument makers as needed for a little spending money. She may have conducted this business from the time when John was still alive. The inventory of John's effects disappeared with an earlier historian and for now is lost. The Revolutionary War stopped most, if not all, instrument building activities, but immediately after its conclusion, we find James Joan, 1736 to 1797, advertising in Philadelphia that he makes the great North American forte piano, quotes, the mechanical part of which is entirely of his own invention and so simple that it is the easiest thing in the world to keep them in order and tune them, end quote. A careful reading of this would translate the word great to mean large, or what we now call a grand piano. He has created or invented some sort of simple action for this grand piano, easy to keep in order. Our problem is that John James Joan's life can be traced back to an early time in Switzerland, and he has no background that we know of in history and instrument making, apart from possibly helping in making violin bows while in Boston during his first period in America. In short, it is unlikely he was an actual builder, nor was his son, Alexander. Curiously, the Berent piano was modified early in its life. The original English grand action was replaced with an English single action. This uses very long hammerheads to clear the rest plank and reused the hammer checks that Berent had fitted as a single action sticker to bump the hammers up to the strings. There is more than a small reason to contemplate that this new action in the Berent piano is the work of Juan. As a, as a solution for possible problems that the Berent English grand action had developed, it was a poor replacement at best. The paper on Berent will also treat this subject. Thomas Dodds arrived from London to New York City in 1785 and stated his intent to make organs, harpsichords, and pianofortes. He claimed 20 years experience, but to date, he is not associated with any other known makers. As with most would-be makers, he likely made his bread and butter early on in America with tunings and repair work. In early 1790, Dodds partnered with a certain Mr. Claus to build pianos. They brought on board a young Archibald Waits as an apprentice, whose name appears in an early surviving Dodds and Claus piano. This early piano was built along the lines of Broadwood squares with rest pins to the rear and brass under dampers hinged now in leather clasps to prevent rattling, an invention claimed by Dodds and Claus. But the later pianos that we see from them are like the Zumpy style with tuning pins on the right near the soundboard and traditional over dampers. In November 1793, William Hatton, musical instrument maker and recently arrived from London, took Dodds and Claus to court over 65 pounds owed him for making cases and soundboards for Dodds and Claus. Dodds and Claus countered that Hatton's work was shoddy. No money was owed for the shingles he used for the soundboards. The court ultimately found in favor of Hatton. During the trial, testimony for Hatton included description of poor shop practice and ignorance on the part of Dodds and Claus. Dodds countered that the witnesses against them also made shoddy pianos and that Hatton's wife was involved in his business, stating this to disparage Hatton. In clearing the name 
of the witnesses for Hatton, three piano builders in New York with former ties to Longman and Broderick, cited examples of poor leather choices by Dawes and Kloss and that Dawes and Kloss altered the excellent work of Hatton before finishing the piano for sale, effectively lessening the quality of the instrument. It was the general opinion of these builders that Dawes and Kloss completed wretched pianos. Whether for this reason or some other, Dawes and Kloss dissolved the partnership in the spring of 1795 and may have done only limited business together in 1794. Charles Taws, 1763 to 1836, first arrived in New York City in 1786, but within a month relocated to Philadelphia, where he remained for the rest of his life. He began as an organ builder and sold imported pianos, but began building pianos under his own name in late 1790. All known Taws pianos were built along the lines of Broadwood, but not as copies of Broadwood, simply taking the approach of tuning pins located to the rear and brass under dampers. In a close comparison between features, we find the Taws pianos to be competently built with efforts to reduce the mass of the key levers, a feature not found on Broadwood pianos from the same time. The dimensions of the case are his own and are well thought through. Taw's approach to structural engineering is different from Broadwood, but uses solid principles, and the finish on the outside of the instruments is conservative, but neatly done, as we see in this example from the one at Sigel. The action frame of the Taws pianos at Sigel bears the signature of Taws White, Elizabeth Taws, her board, spelled B-O-R-D, in a homemade ink, the ink also used for lettering other parts of the action. We speculate that Taws wife was working with him in his shop and was proud to have done so. While this example is one of only a few where the wives are documented to be working with their builder husbands, it must have been fairly common for wives to assist where possible. Taws began advertising London-made pianos from his shop again in 1794 and was selling ivory and ebony for making pianos later that year. From 1795, Taws dealt exclusively with imported pianos and had given up building. Several of his surviving pianos are numbered such that it is likely that he built perhaps a total of some 24, or about six to eight per year. Twelve of these have survived, an astounding survival rate, but Taw's pianos were often sold to families that would come to be counted as founding fathers, and their material goods closely protected. We had encountered John Sellers as a builder earlier, and he clearly made several pianos while building principally organs in America. He used the German approach with Stoss mechanic action, the hammers reversed from the usual orientation that the English uh, pianos used, but with more conventional over dampers. A recently acquired anonymous square piano built in Virginia also uses this action, so that the influence of immigrants from the Germanic states is obvious. Given the relative size and desire to come to America rather than ever leave for Europe, most influences during the early American period are obviously one way, that of being brought into America. This, of course, would change dramatically by the middle of the 19th century. We had also encountered Archibald Waits, 1766 to 1815, who with George Charters began making pianos in New York in late 1795 or early 1796. This early example in the Sigel Museum uh, suffers a similar confusion to the Berent piano inscription, giving a name board that indicates London was the place of origin. This was likely a Scribner's error and meant to say from London, as number 19 Berkeley Street is definitely in New York City. The piano is fairly standard for a long and Broderick design type of the period and does not take the Broadwood approach that Waits and was associated with while at the Dodds business. John Guy, 1744 to 1818, 
immigrated to America in 1797. He began building large church organs when he arrived, but by 1802, he had begun to make pianos with his son, John Guy Jr. The Guy firm was careful and consistent as builders with a damper lift mechanism of their own design, which was used throughout the 40 years the firm made pianos. With the advent of Guy in America, the country's early period of piano making came to maturity. Guy gave his finest pianos a look that went far beyond anything made or even considered acceptable in London with a styling that is purely American. Sickle has the only known piano made under the banner of Benjamin Crayhor and Louis Bab Babcock, circa 1805 in Boston. Crayhor was the first person to make pianos in Boston, beginning about 1797, and Babcock was an apprentice along with his soon-to-be-famous younger brother, Alpheus. William Bent was also associated with Cray Horror, and several Bent pianos survive, one once in the Sigel collection, but dispersed shortly after Marlo, Marlo Sigel's death. The Cray Horror and Babcock square piano circa 1805 is much like earlier pianos built for Longman and Broderick, with over-dampers and five octaves, English double action, but none of the William Southwell improvements. It does use an ingenious hand stop that allows one hand stop to control both the treble and bass dampers independently, and a damper pad in a cylindrical form, unlike any other known. Between 1800 and 1835, the number of piano makers in New York City alone grew dramatically, from four to over 40. Philadelphia and Boston saw similar but smaller growth and Baltimore became a major producer. The Embargo Act of 1807, followed by the War of 1812, stopped piano importation completely until 1815. American piano making was established during the law, and the influence of London and Europe on American piano makers became significantly reduced. Clearly, the last quarter of the 18th century saw a considerable number of piano craftsmen and their families come to America in hopes of earning their fortune, and for many, the dream came true. What we have learned, however, is that the business was firmly established far earlier than thought and often contemporary with the advances made overseas. We should not think of early America as simply copying instrument designs from London and Europe but rather as a country of craftsmen trained overseas, but ready to create pianos that satisfied the American taste with designs that became increasingly less like their London counterparts and more prototypically American in nature. Thank you.